even after Americans elected a black man as president, and after that president, Barack Obama placed a bust of King in the Oval Office. The nation remains racked with racism, ethno-nationalism, cultural division, residential and educational segregation, economic inequality, violence, and a fading sense of hope that government or anyone will ever fix those problems. Where do we go from here? In spite of the way America treated him, King still had faith when he asked that question. Today, his words might help us make our way through these troubled times, but only if we actually read them. Only if we embrace the complicated king, the flawed king, the human king, the radical king. Only if we see and hear him clearly again, as America saw and heard him once before. Our very, our very survival, he wrote, depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, Boston Public Library, and the Museum of African American History, ably produced tonight, this event, by GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors NEHGS and a producer of this series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at our country's past, the life, work, and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. It's my pleasure to introduce our featured guest. Jonathan Eig is the best-selling author of Ali, A Life, as in Muhammad Ali. It was the winner of the 2018 Penn America Literary Award and a finalist for the Mark Linton History Prize. He served as a senior consulting producer for the PBS series, Muhammad Ali. His first book, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, won the Casey Award. Jonathan Eig's books have been listed among the best of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Having seen Jonathan in action in person last month in Boston, I know the next hour is going to be riveting. There is so much to learn about MLK Jr. Now, for some information on our second guest, over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Margaret. And on behalf of the Boston Public Library, welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Motti from the programs team at the library. We're grateful to be in partnership on tonight's program with the Museum of African American History, the GBH Forum Network, and of course, American Ancestors, NEHGS, all neighbors in Boston. Tonight, I have the honor of sharing a bit of information about this evening's moderator, Professor Peniel E. Joseph. Professor Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values, founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and the Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. He is also an author, the author of The Sword and the Shield and Stokely, A Life, and most recently, The Third Reconstruction. Jonathan Eig and Professor Joseph, welcome. Thank you. All right, so this is, this is it's my pleasure. Uh, Jonathan is a friend and I, I enjoyed his previous books um, on especially on on Muhammad Ali and learned so much for it uh, from it. Um, but this book, King, I'm gonna give everybody a, a <laughs> that I have with me right here. King a life is really an extraordinary book and it's been acclaimed. I want to from coast to coast. Jonathan, I want to start out with uh, a question for you. Um, why why King? You've done these great biographies of you know Lou Gehrig, Muhammad Ali, in certain ways, King is uh, another American founding father uh, and, and mother alongside of people like uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. And there's been Pulitzer Prize winning books on King, David Garrow, who you 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 worked with and, and Taylor Branch and others. So what, why, what inspired you to write this biography? Well, thanks, Peniel. And let me say thanks to you for all your work and your help in guiding me, coaching me along the way in this book. Um, so I think that the key for me was the appreciation that it had been a long time since the last King biography when I got started. And those get those books you mentioned by Taylor Branch and David Garrow are not 
in my view, really straightforward biographies. They're American history books with a lot of king in them. And, and, I, and I've talked to Taylor and Dave about that, and they would agree that they don't consider their books biography. Biography does something a little different, as your Stokely Carmichael book does so well. It helps you walk alongside that person, and it lets you have a more intimate view of history. And, you know, it suffers some um, weaknesses because it's focused on one person. But through that person, you not only see what they're going through, you see how they're changing the world. And in the case of King, in the time since the last biography, the last true biography, 1982, we've seen his image watered down. We've seen him defanged. We've seen him turned into this very safe figure. And we've forgotten that he was a radical and that he was dangerous, which is why the FBI cracked down on the way they did, because they correctly recognized that he posed a threat to the status quo and to the white establishment remaining in power. And I wanted to write a book that gave him his teeth back. I also wanted to write a book while some of the folks who knew him were still around. And, and that was really the epiphany for me that while I was interviewing folks for my Muhammad Ali book, I realized that a lot of them knew Dr. King. So I just began asking uh, people like Dick Gregory and Andrew Young and Harry Belafonte and Juanita Abernathy, uh, what was it like to be around King? And my curiosity just took over at that point. Now, I, I want to start with the, the beginning of the book and the first parts, because this really is such an intimate um, biography. And I think this is the first book where I, I learned so much in the sense of um, you really focus on the two early uh, suicide attempts by Dr. King. Um, you focus on the family dynamics of, of his, being raised by you know, his, his grandmother, uh, his, his maternal grandmother being raised by his mother and father. Uh, you 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 don't really smooth over the rough edges. You, you know you you say, hey, th this was a household that there were there were tensions there. You know there was a lot of success, but there was a lot of tension and a lot of stress. You know you show in the book that by the time he's older, Dr. King says his father helped ruin his younger brother, A.D. Uh, King, who becomes, uh, you know, this talented person, but was also an alcoholic and, and, and battles problems. So let, let's talk about the, the, the intimacy, the King household that you describe as something that's really exceedingly nurturing, but also nurturing within the context of the Jim Crow system. And the final thing I'll say is that you really illuminate the 1939 Gone with the Wind with you know, the, the choir and the tabernacle. And when I update the sword and the shield, we'll really get deeper into that, uh, where, they, they, you know, they're dressed in, in the clothes of enslaved people um, in 1939. I mean, this is extraordinary. And King is right there, the 10-year-old King with Gone with the Wind. This is like mind-blowing. Yeah, you can see the picture. If you look online, you can't quite make out MLK, but you can see the picture of the Ebenezer Choir with little kids sitting in the front dressed in the clothes of enslaved people. And Martin Luther King is there singing along at this celebration of slavery, basically, which is what Gone with the Wind was all about. And it's fascinating, but there's so much to unpack even in just that photograph. And your question leaves a lot to unpack, uh, but I'll start with that photograph because Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr. was, Raised in Stockbridge, Georgia, uh, he was in a sharecropper's shack. His his father and mother um, were the children of enslaved people. They were born actually into enslavement. And Daddy King, at age 12, walks off that farm in Stockbridge with his shoes slung over his shoulder so he doesn't wear them out because that's his only pair. And he makes his way to Atlanta, where he reinvents himself. He gets a job at the railroad and then becomes a preacher, um, goes to school, learns how to read and write at, in his 20s and then marries into the family that controls, that, uh, that, that operates Ebenezer Baptist Church. And he, his rise is one of the great American stories um, because he makes it possible for Martin Luther King Jr. to be Martin Luther King Jr. And yet there's enormous tension between father and son. As you said, you know, Daddy King drove his son AD into alcoholism. Martin Luther King Jr. had huge issues with his father. Um, really cowered in his in his wake and in his shadow, struggled to be different, didn't want to be the kind of emotional preacher that his daddy was, didn't want to be the womanizer that his daddy was. He didn't uh, do so well um, in, in resisting that urge. But uh, the relationship is always a push and pull. When, when Martin Luther King um, goes to Montgomery, Daddy King says, don't go there. It's the wrong church for you. When he becomes the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott, Daddy says, don't do it. You're going to get killed. 
at it, don't stick your neck out. So Martin Luther King is always throughout his entire life in this very complicated relationship with his father. And I think it's one of the keys to understanding him because when it comes to opposing racism, when it comes to opposing Jim Crow, there's no one more courageous. And yet, even in doing that, Martin Luther King is afraid really to stand up to other activists. He's afraid to confront Roy Wilkins. He's afraid to get into an argument with JFK or LBJ. He's afraid to say, you know, Mr. President Johnson, you want to work with me, you got to get the F FBI off my back. Mm -hmm. He's afraid of confrontation in, in a way that is bizarre for, you know, our greatest protest leader, but it all stems from his relationship with his father. Now, one of the things I think that's remarkable about your book on King is the devotion, the, the attention you pay to Coretta Scott King. And I think this is the real first book in so many ways that really shows what a huge gargantuan influence Coretta is um, intellectually, politically, spiritually, personally, and that they also have a great love story, even though it has ups and downs like every love story has. You know, love stories aren't just on one trajectory straight up, right? And so I want you to talk about that, you know, how you really get inside of their story. And I think reading your book, you really come to see how dynamic Coretta is so she wasn't this prisoner in the relationship who just took all this stuff. She's co-leading this, this movement. And you really see why she continued the partnership up until, up until the end, right? Um, so I want you to talk about, about that and really how much he leans on Coretta. And we, we haven't given um, that kind of insight and that kind of analysis of really how important Coretta Scott King is as this 20th century civil rights leader and activist and intellectual. Yeah, when you consider, when you begin to understand Coretta's real strength and her real sense of purpose and her real commitment to the cause, that makes it a lot easier to understand why she puts up with some of the things that um, very few of us can imagine putting up with, knowing that your husband is cheating on you and having the FBI sending you tapes of his uh, interactions with other women. How did Coretta do that? But I think, again, getting back to the roots, thinking about these people as people, which is what a big part of my job is here with this book, is to restore some of their humanity. Why does Martin Luther King fall in love with Coretta? Why does he pick her? He is dating lots of women. Uh, I, I interviewed one of King's best friends, uh, June Dobbs Butts, who knew him all the way through elementary school. And June's sister dated King. June's best friend was engaged to King. And why did King marry Coretta of all these women? Um, I think it's because she had a greater resume as an activist. She had more experience as an activist than he did when they met in Boston. And I think that he was really turned on by her intellect, by her passion for the cause, by her beauty. But primarily, he saw her as a potential partner that they would make a powerful combination. And they did. Um, it's, it's really Coretta who's not just, you know, unfortunately, you know, King is also hobbled by a kind of sexism that's common uh, in his day, but uh, even more pronounced among um, Southern Baptist uh, preachers. And he expects Coretta to stay home and raise the children, even as she implores him and says, I feel called to this mission too. He still does not wake up and he cannot really shed his own prejudices in that way. But Coretta is nevertheless, you know, persisting and pushing and making her voice heard, making her influence felt. Um, when, when King wins the Nobel Prize, it's Coretta who says, we, not you, we now have a greater responsibility to look at a broader slate of issues, to look at war, to look at poverty. Um, and, and she takes that very seriously. Now, one of the things I think you show, especially I'm thinking now of parts one and two, is the intellectual and religious makeup uh, that forges King. I'd like you to talk about that because I think you really, like you were saying before, you take King seriously as a human being, but you also take him seriously as a man of faith, as somebody who truly believes in um, the gospel, in the social gospel, um, who truly studies that. And, and you also look at his insecurities because you don't shy away from the plagiarism. You don't shy away from uh, where, where he falters. But as you do in the chapter where you really look at Letter from Birmingham Jail, King was absolutely brilliant, you know, like what's so interesting and you show it there when he's just going himself and he's not thinking about a PhD committee. He's not thinking about impressing white or black folks. 
he's absolutely brilliant. And like you say, he's he's really a synthesizer. He's a synthesizer. He's somebody who can who can read a hundred different texts, a thousand different texts and sermons, and he distills it into something that's actually new and original, right? And so I, I'd like you to talk about that because I think because of all the things that have come out about King in the ensuing years from the 80s to the present, there's this idea that King, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the plagiarism, different allegations that somehow he's not this, this, in, this intellect, this, this, he's a great orator, but is he a great thinker? And I think this book proves really definitively he's, he's both. He is really both. And he's the perfect man for this moment because he is, as you said, really a product of the black social gospel. His whole being really is tied up in this idea and it's unique. The black social gospel is very different from the other, from the white social gospel or the plain social gospel because it's rooted in the idea that Christianity is connected to slavery, to enslavement, yeah. that black people are being mistreated and the Bible says that that is wrong. Mm -hmm. So how do you justify your belief in the Bible with your status in American society? working out that problem becomes the core of religious belief for black Christians. And King becomes the avatar of that. He becomes the perfect voice for that problem. And he's able to combine the calls for democracy with the calls for faith, religious faith in a way that really no one else possibly could have. There were intellectuals like William Thurman writing that and, and, and seeing that, that thread intellectually, philosophically, but King is able to get into the pulpit and inspire people to march alongside him and inspire white people to suddenly think about things differently because he's just an intellectual and a brilliant communicator. He's able to force people to rethink their prejudices for the first time in many cases. And that ability to reach black and white, that ability to combine the spiritual and the intellectual and the political, that's really what makes him special. And it's hard to imagine anyone else um, you know, Ella Baker said that King didn't make the, uh, the movement, made King, that King didn't make the movement. But it, I, it, I'm not so sure because it's hard to imagine anyone else filling that role so perfectly. And speaking of Baker, you, you throughout the book, you really look at the, the, the dialectical relationship between King and civil rights activists, including an ordinary people, including people like Baker, he had tensions with. So I'd love for you to talk about that because certainly in Montgomery, Alabama, for instance, King isn't the most seasoned organizer there. As you said, Coretta is a bigger <laughs> activist than he is at that point. Um, how does King really utilize um, interactions with people, both within the movement, but just ordinary people to transform himself and become this mobilizer, this person who learns from organizers, who learns from activists, who becomes an activist, who can also teach as much as he's learning. What, what is that process? Because I think you, you, you show the process and some of it, you know, King has to become much more, uh, take doses of humility uh, in, in ways that he's not used to, as you said, coming out of that, that black patriarchal Christian church tradition. Yeah, one of the things that's really remarkable about King is his ability to learn and to not take things personally. You know, he's called to action in Montgomery and discovers that he has this great gift for leadership. He's not looking to be an activist. He's looking to run the church uh, and maybe to become a, a, a college professor or a college president someday. But he finds that the people respond to him in a way that is so powerful. And, and you can hear it. You know, I found these transcripts of interviews with, with ordinary um, folks from Montgomery, people who were, you know, working as housekeepers, who said um, Dr. King was God sent, and that they weren't going to allow their white employers to criticize him. They would lose their jobs before they would listen to anybody talking trash about Martin Luther King. And every time he's called into action, you know, these other organizers, they kind of resent him. They call him the Lord, L D A D E L A W D, as if he's high and mighty as if he's something special. You know, they've got this bus boy, they've got this, this, the freedom rides going, they've got these lunch counter protests going, here comes King, we don't need him, but they, they find that they do need him. Whenever he arrives, he brings a kind of force to these movements. He's able to coalesce the power, coalesce the message, and of course, bring the white media from the North down to write about it. 
So even the people who criticized him and, you know, Stokely Carmichael is a great example. Stokely loved to, to, to talk trash and to tease him and to say, you know, you're, you're, you're highfalutin, um, you know, conservative. And, and, and yet he needed King. He needed King to, to rally the, the, the crowds, needed King to bring the media attention. And King was OK. You know, as he, he said to Stokely, that's OK. I've been used before. I know what you're doing. And um, he was really open um, to learning from the others. And, and he, he maintained a kind of humility that is rare for somebody who had that much power and that much fame. Well, let's discuss King's relationship with Malcolm X, because you made, you know, great news, national news by uncovering that this Playboy magazine article, King's longest interview that was published uh, 1965. Right. Um, uh, that there's a there's a quote there from King that seems to really viciously attack Malcolm. And when you looked at the transcript, you could see that Alex Haley um, actually really invents that that quote um, based on the evidence that you found. So let's talk about both that, um, which which again made national headlines. And what do you make of King's relationship with Malcolm X? And in what ways have we gotten that relationship wrong publicly in terms of our historical memory, the way we represent that relationship? Well, let me just say that, you know, you got it right in this terrific book. <laughs> um, and um, the, in general, though, and, and you document this really well, Malcolm X found it useful to, to attack King, to call him an Uncle Tom and Dr. Chicken Wings or whatever other creative um, lines he came up with, because it made him look more dangerous. It made him look like a greater threat. It scared white people and it excited, you know, his black audiences that, you know, we don't have to play these games with politicians that Martin Luther King is playing. We can we can do this on our own. We don't need to compromise. That was really exciting. Um, the question is, though, how did Martin Luther King perceive that? Because he didn't strike back. And what we have, the, the greatest, uh, most often quoted um, response we have from King is this one uh, from Playboy magazine uh, that Alex Haley wrote. So I went to the archive of Alex Haley's papers and found the original transcript of that interview. And um, I found that King did not say what Haley reported. Haley said, you know, in his litany of articulating the despair of the Negro without offering any positive creative alternative, you know, I feel Malcolm has done himself and our people a great disservice. And King did not say that. He said something similar to that when asked about black separatists like the Nation of Islam. But when asked about Mart about Malcolm, King actually re replied with great open mindedness. He said, I don't think I have all the answers. I think Malcolm and I, you know, probably have more in common than we than we think. And, and that just goes to show not just, you know, how King's words were distorted, but it goes to show how the media and mostly the white media, but Haley was working for a white publication. In this case, he's a black writer, but the media is joining the FBI's campaign to try to divide and conquer civil rights leaders. There's a sense that uh, if they gain too much power, if they're able to coalesce and unite the factions, that they might pose a real threat to the status quo, to the white power structure. And they must be, they must be div divided. And that's what, exactly what Haley's doing with that quote. You know, I want to talk with the time we have left about, and you really spend the second half of the book with the chapters on the dream, part one, part two, King's evolution from 63 to 68. Because I think what you show here, especially with the letter from Birmingham jail and the writing on that is riveting. And I'm working on 63 now, so I'm, I'm completely inspired. Um, but with that Birmingham letter from Birmingham jail and March on Washington, you really show in 63 a king who, even if the media is not representing him this way, is absolutely um, this radical political activist who's saying, you know, in letter from Birmingham jail, he's calling out white liberals, he's calling out the white clergy, he's he's saying he's going to be very, very nice, and then he writes this 20-page <laughs> letter that excoriates white liberals, that says that they're, they're a bigger impediment to Black citizenship and dignity than the Klan and white supremacists and racial terrorists, because they refuse to stand in solidarity with what they know is right. And then with the March on Washington speech, he's calling out uh, racism systemically. He's calling out 
uh, governors of Mississippi and Alabama. He's calling out this whole history of the original sin of the United States and racial slavery in a way that kind of gets overtaken by that final peroration of I have a dream, right? So I'd love for you to talk about 63 and, and sort of that being sort of a pivot point. Sometimes we look at Watts in 65 as a pivot point and you look at that as well. But let, let's talk about the evolution of King um, who really does become this pillar of revolutionary fire um, as the 60s progress in ways that I don't think the country still has come to terms with. Yeah, I couldn't agree more because if you look at what King talks about in that I have a dream speech before he gets into the I have a dream portion, he's talking about police brutality. He's talking about reparations. He's talking about economic injustice. It's called the March for Jobs and Freedom. Um, it's not just the March on Washington, but we forget that. We get busy quoting the I have a dream portion, and we're still doing that today. You know, ask anybody to quote a line other than, you know, from the first half of that speech, and, and they can't. All they, all they got is I have a dream and content of our, our character. Um, and that's a, that's a serious loss because it's exactly the issues we're talking about today. And uh, the other thing that happens in 63, so the March on Washington is this high water mark. It really feels like the country might be ready to change. We've just watched on national television, this beautiful image of peaceful protesters, black and white, hand in hand, singing in harmony. And we leave that with a sense that maybe this country really is ready to put some of its past behind it. And, and I, I spoke to people who talked about how they went home and, and, and they talked to their factory workers about, about the fact that we need to integrate this factory now. You know, we can't wait any longer. Um, I, 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 I talked to somebody who said that he never told his coworkers that he was married to a black woman until March on Washington. And he went the next day to work and said, you know, I, I need to tell you guys something. Um, it was changing America. And yet there is this backlash. And every time King seems to be making progress, there's this backlash. And the most visible backlash, of course, for the nation is the bombing of the 16th Street Church in Birmingham, where little children are, 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 are killed uh, by, by white racists who are angry at, this, at what they've seen. They, the racial harmony that inspired so many infuriated them. But the other backlash that we need to talk about is that the FBI responded to the March on Washington by saying, this can't go any further. If he becomes more powerful, he's going to undo everything we've worked to preserve in this country. They literally produce a memo saying that King must be treated as the most dangerous black radical in America. And that's what changes the next you know, five years of his life. He becomes the subject of this massive campaign by the FBI to destroy his career, break up his marriage, and perhaps even compel him to commit suicide. And that's a great segue into talking about that kind of harassment, because how much because of what you just said and you, you know, you've done all this amazing research, Jonathan, how much of the FBI stuff against King can we believe knowing that, you know, even these allegations that, hey, we've got transcripts that are going to be released in 2028 or 2029. And King was there where there was some orgy and a woman was sexually assaulted and he did nothing. How much of this can we believe knowing it's more than a poison pill, it's more than mendacity, but knowing they they willingly uh, lied about King, they willingly uh, broke laws to surveil and harass King. Historians and scholars like yourself and journalists use the, and I've used it too, the sort of the FBI archive, but like how much of it can we take as 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 in terms of the veracity of it when it comes to sort of smearing him in a way that would be so bad as to make the country sort of reconsider the holiday and stuff into, you know, like in terms of new information that's going to come out, like how, yeah. what should we do with that? It's, it's tricky because we, we know that the FBI is out to get him. So we have to take everything with a grain of salt, but we also know that the transcripts, as far as we can tell, have been proven accurate. Okay. So people who are recorded on those transcripts, like Andrew Young, um, Bayard Rustin, who, who looked at his own um, transcripts of his wiretaps because his home phone was wired, was wiretapped. They say that the, the conversations transcribed are accurate. That is what, what they said. Now, that doesn't mean that the notes and the memos are accurate. 
Mm-hmm. So we have these transcripts and they do reveal that King was on the phone with mistresses and, and there's no reason to believe those transcriptions are, are false, but the memos in which they describe these orgies, as you said, um, in which King is said to be present that we have to wait and see until we hear these tapes. But, you know, even then I think we have to approach it with a grain of salt because, you know, Coretta listened to some of these tapes and she said, you know, I know what my husband sounds like and that's not him. Mm. And, um, so I think King deserves to be um, treated as innocent until proven guilty on that front. But the other really important thing about those tapes is that we need to remember that the government was using them to weaponize their uh, to their King's infidelities, that they were trying to use that to destroy him. They were leaking this to the press. And it wasn't just J. Edgar Hoover. President Johnson himself was aware, involved and encouraging these attacks and uh, the, the news media which often takes credit for not writing about King's infidelities, deserves uh, a little bit of credit for that, but also deserves to be blamed for not reporting on what they knew was going on, that the government was surveilling a private citizen. And that was the much bigger story. So, um, you know, I think what's important about King's um, flaws is A, that he was human and we don't need our heroes to be perfect. Uh, We we should be amazed and, and inspired by the fact that he persevered in spite of his flaws. And what's important is that, you know, he had to do so as the, these flaws were being weaponized by our own, you know, law enforcement agencies. Now, as we get closer to the end of the book, you, you get deeper into the anti-Vietnam War protest, the anti-imperialism. Uh, there's a great chapter, chapter 44, Revolution of Values, which is one of the phrases that King uses um, by 67. Let's discuss that. I mean, I think we a lot of times we talk about the poor people's campaign. We talk about King's shift into uh, really a, a robust anti-imperialism. Uh, he's against militarism, materialism, and racism. But I think we we don't talk enough about what did what exactly did he mean by a revolution of values? Because you've already we've already discussed that. Hey, King is imperfect, uh, so he's not sort of this self righteous leader um, in that sense. Uh, so I don't I don't think of King as a hypocrite. I think of him as a very, very flawed person with with these huge shortcomings, but who also is very, very brilliant and talented and has these political commitments. And I would also say he has these moral commitments, but it's not a morality that we define vis-a-vis um, infidelity and things like that. It's a larger morality of taking care of each other and loving each other deeply uh, and in public. So what, let's let's discuss that. What do you think? And you obviously wrote a whole chapter on this. But what do you think he meant by a revolution of values? And how does that continue to reverberate in our own time? Well, in the spirit of Jesus and in the spirit of the of Bible, he really believed that there was we all had a responsibility to try to transform not just ourselves but society. That we needed to make we we think of ourselves as partners with God in healing the planet, healing the universe. And that fundamentally meant learning to love each other. And he wasn't, you know, posturing when he said he wanted people, he wanted, you know, to love Bull Connor. He wanted to love the white supremacists who were attacking him. He wanted to show them that he cared about them and that in turn, spreading that kind of love would transform all of us. And, you know, a lot of his friends, his his advisors were saying, let's just stick to voting rights. Let's just stick to desegregation. We're really strong there. We can just keep working on that until we get our folks registered to vote and we transform the democratic process. We get our own people into Congress, into the state houses. And that wasn't enough for King. He believed that, as he said over and over again, fundamentally, I'm a Baptist preacher. He was not a political leader. And when his friends criticized him in this way, he said, you know, I might not be doing the right thing politically, but I know I'm doing the right thing morally. And that meant going to the North and calling out the racists in Chicago, calling out segregation in Chicago and Philadelphia and New York, calling out the the segregated schools and the the, the slumlord housing. It it was not pragmatic. It was what he felt like he had to do, not as um, as a leader of a protest movement or not to raise the most money for the SCLC, but to follow God's commandments, to follow the words that he preached. He actually believed them. And that's what, you know, is so I think that's in some ways why this book is is resonating with people the way it is, because it's just so rare that you find a moral leader who he's not perfect. He doesn't, 
he, he knows he's a sinner, but he's trying to live up to the highest and most important moral values that he can. Yeah, in so many ways, when I was reading this book, it reminds me, he reminds me of Malcolm X um, as, as this person with deep, deep faith, who again is imperfect, but actually truly believes this. You know, my final question before um, we, we open it up for audience Q&A is, you know, near, near the end of the book, you really um, are, are very contemplative vis-a-vis, you know, what, is, what does King mean for us now? You know, like you, you get into, you, you, know, you know, sort of the influence, the legacy of this person who's really become a gargantuan iconic figure, but as you show in this book, in turning him into such a big figure, we lost the human being who was a father of four, who was a husband, who was a brother, who was a son. Um, we, we sort of lost that. And, and what you do with this book is take us back there to, to be able to really better understand how he lived his life. So I'd say in terms of, I know there's going to be a point you're going to read this, some of the epilogue, but what do you, what do you, after you do all this research, the book is beautifully written. What, what is your, what is your hopeful takeaway for people from, from reading King Alive, especially now in 2023 with all the headwinds that we face for building the beloved community that King talked about? You know, the national holiday, which King richly deserves and which Coretta worked so hard to establish you know, had an unintended side effect in that it dulled our vision of King. Mm-hmm. It caused us to soften his image and to fail to see his sharp edges, to fail to see his, his radicalism. So I hope that my book will serve as kind of a serum, um, a compliment to the, um, to the national holiday that reminds us that he was dangerous, he was brave, he, he suffered and, and had moments of doubt. Um, he had moments of depression. He was hospitalized numerous times, and yet he persevered. And I think if there's one message for us today that, that King um, can offer, it's not, I have a dream. It's not, let's all you know hold hands and, and sing Kumbaya. It's, we all have to dedicate ourselves in whatever way we can. We, we, we can't all be Martin Luther King, but we can all try to do something to in that same spirit to improve our communities, to try to work toward change, that we are living in a time that feels hopeless. It feels like our political system is, is bankrupt, incapable of getting anything done. We're all divided. Um, we don't come together in church or synagogue the way we used to. We're, we're following only our close friends on social media and hearing only the views that make us comfortable. You know, King challenged all of that. King asked us to really embrace a broader view of, of the universe and what it means to love one another. And I think if we, if we go back to listening to his real words and not just the words that have been you know, sugarcoated for us, but if we go back to reading his books and listening to his sermons, he can still help us today because he was calling out and warning us about everything that we're living through today. And um, I think, uh, you know, I guess what I hope most for the book is that we listen to him again uh, with, with um, you know, with the kind of ears that we listened to him once before. Oh, great. No, thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to um, shift to some audience uh, questions. We're going to have some live audience questions too, and we already have some but some that have been, have, have come in. Um, uh, my first is, somebody wants to know, can you speculate on how history might've changed had MLK, Dr. King not been assassinated Thursday, April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee? Wow, that's a great question. And Peniel, I'd like to hear your take on that too. Um, but you know, I think that King would have continued to push us out of our comfort zone. And he was planning this poor people's campaign, what he called the shift from the civil rights movement to the human rights movement. And he was trying to change the dynamic so it didn't feel so much about race, but about the bigger issues that divided us and the bigger issues that kept um, many Americans from feeling like equal citizens. He was focused on poverty and inequality, on education, on jobs. And he wanted us to Think about, you know, a, a different kind of American democracy and a different kind of capitalism, one that offered greater support and um, made atonement for the sins of the past. And I think, 
you know, whether we were going to listen to that, who knows, but I know he would have kept fighting for that. And um, I would just also add that, you know, when he was assassinated, we had a choice in how we react to that. And, you know, Michelle Alexander's written about this in her terrific book, um, the, the New Jim Crow. Um, we could have responded by embracing his values, by acting on the wishes that he was presenting to us late in life to become a more compassionate society. And instead, we we uh, focused on, um, you know, jailing the protesters and the um, people who were, you know, um, angry in the streets. And we we're still focused on incarceration rather than on on the true meaning of justice. So I feel like, um, you know, once again, uh, we, we haven't really been listening to King's voice. I've got another question here. Um, where does one begin researching, interviewing, writing, et cetera, subjects of interest? That's, that's, that's great. It's a process question. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you do all this? Well, um, it's scary. As you know, it's intimidating. You just think that there's no way I can do this. It's too big a subject. There's too much to read. There's too many people to talk to, but you just dive in at some point. And what I did mostly is um, I began by interviewing people who knew King because they were getting up there in years. So before I was even really prepared, before I was educated enough, I was knocking on doors and asking people like Andy Young and Harry Belafonte to give me some of their time and asking them also, did they think that it would be okay for me to do a new King biography. Would they help? And then I began reaching out to people like you, to the scholars, the experts in the field saying, what do you think? You know, will you help? Can, 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 can I get away with this? And, um, and then looking for new archival material. You know, in this case, I was really blessed to find um, Kurt, tapes that Curtis Scott King made um, just months after her husband's death. Um, the papers of L.D. Reddick, who was the official historian of the SCLC who traveled with King and Coretta to India and who took voluminous notes. I was the first person to open those boxes. Uh, you know, so many, so I begin digging through the archives, reading history books, interviewing everybody I can. And I don't even think about writing for at least the first year or two. I'm just trying to, you know, overcome my ignorance as much as I possibly can. This question says, um... If Martin Luther King were alive today, what do you think he would think about current events and the state of race in American society and really world society? Because King is a global thinker and activist. Have you seen that uh, Boondocks episode where King comes back to life? He's <laughs> he's, he's he's been in a coma. He, he survived the shooting. And he's mad. He's really mad. You should all watch that after this. But I, I want to ask, see what you say about that one, Peniel. What do you think he would have to say today? You, you know, I think I think what's so interesting is like you show here, especially when you talk about revolution of values. I think that King would be, you know, and obviously you, you see Reverend William Barber leading the Poor People's Campaign. I think he would be a, a continued social movement leader. I think. As you show here, King was never interested in elected office, you know, for, you know, for even though people wanted him to run for president and do these things. He, and it's like you said, he, he was a preacher. He's, 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 a, he's a man of, of God. So I think he would be leading a, a, a social movement that would be very critical of, you know, of both political parties, very, very critical of the status quo, but would also challenge us to, like you said, to love each other, you know, because that's, I mean, he really, um, he really believes that. And that that's tough for us to think because now, you know, and I said it in the sword and the shield that, you know, Ma Malcolm, I, I say Malcolm X is wrong in thinking that nonviolence is weak. Right. I, I say, you know, and I think I think Malcolm X was wrong. I mean, I think he was right about a lot of stuff, but I think he was wrong about that because King's nonviolence is so um, courageous and powerful. And, and it also is very compelling. It actually is coercive. It actually changes the country in ways that the country doesn't want to be changed. And yeah. that's when you're a revolutionary. So I think he would continue that tactic. And like you show, you no, know, by the end, he wasn't very popular, Jonathan, because that was yeah. another great thing about this. Like, I love that you show that, that, but he was still compelling because 125 million people watched the funeral, right? It's like, right. it's like, so it's so, isn't it interesting to have somebody who's not popular? Obviously he had a higher approval rating in the black community, but who people are still riveted by. I don't know if we have anybody like that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the black community ever abandoned him. The white community abandoned him in droves when he began speaking out about Vietnam and talking about poverty. 
Um, but um, the black community never really did. They, you know, obviously some people wanted to push harder. Some people were more interested in what Stokely Carmichael was saying, but that, those, those are, you know, much smaller portions. The, the mainstream still loved and worshiped Dr. King. And I just want to say one more thing about that, the, the question about what Dr. King would say today. I asked John Lewis that question and he got really quiet. Like he was thinking about it and he lowered his head and he then said, how long? Not long. How long? Not long. And I was just in tears. Oh, that is great. All right. So we have a live question. Um, was there someone for whom Dr. King wanted to sit down and have a talk with about race relations, but was not able to bring that about? Um, yeah. Um, you know, I think King was really frustrated that um, JFK would not engage on the subject with him. And he thought that that Kennedy was going to be a great ally. And he was deeply frustrated that Kennedy was more concerned with political optics, was more concerned with steel prices um, than with the civil rights issues before him and had to be forced, had to have his feet put to the fire. And, um, you know, I think um, that was a conversation that King would have really enjoyed. I think even with LBJ, they didn't really, you know, have the kinds of philosophical discussions. It was all very pragmatic. And, you know, they didn't understand him. They didn't understand why he wasn't playing ball politically. And he didn't understand them. He didn't understand why they didn't want to really dig in and discuss the philosophy of race and, and the, the, the history of this country. And, and I think that was really um, upsetting. You know, I'll, I'll share one brief anecdote. When King finished his speech at the March on Washington, he and a bunch of other, other activists, A. Philip Randolph and Roy Wilkins, uh, went over to the White House and President Kennedy greeted them and uh, served them some sandwiches. And, um, and in the discussion that followed, Kennedy said, you know, um, that was beautiful. Um, that, that, that whole afternoon was, was really moving. But what you need to do, what you people, as he said, need to do is um, be more like the, the Jews and, and get your get your children educated, get them, get them to stay in school and you know, talk about a disconnect. And finally, Roy Wilkins interrupts him. And, and we have all this on tape. You can listen to it at the JFK Library website. Um, finally, Roy Wilkins interrupts him and says, Mr. President, you do your job. We'll do ours. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, we have a question about the relationship between Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel. Uh, speaking that dovetails nicely into what you just commented on. Um, that's also that's that's relationship that's been mythologized. What what it, what's the what is your research found? What are any insights of how close were they? Um, did they maintain that relationship? Um, that that relationship it means a lot to both Black Jewish communities, especially those who are interested in Black Jewish rapprochement with each other uh, politically. Uh, both then and especially now? I think a lot of the people I interviewed for this book, a lot of the black activists in the civil rights movement viewed Heschel as like one of the godfathers of the movement. Um, they they really appreciated not just his contributions, but the contributions of, of all of the, the Northern religious figures, including many rabbis who came South to to march, not just in Selma, but in you know, St. Augustine. And, and, and there was a great sense of support uh, and a great feeling of camaraderie. King spoke many times at Northern synagogues. And, and there was also a lot of financial support coming from the North that, that King appreciated. And the fact that, that these rabbis and other faith leaders were willing to come down, you know, sight unseen and, and just arrive in Selma overnight and march alongside the, uh, the Black civil rights activists was, was deeply moving. And I, I think it's important too that Heschel really celebrated King. And Heschel wrote the definitive book on the prophets. And it was Heschel who said, Martin Luther King is a living prophet. And, and the soul of America may depend on how we treat Martin Luther King Jr. The future of America may depend on Martin Luther King's vision. So for Heschel to, to appreciate King in that way, I think um, just goes to show the, you know, the love both went both ways. Yeah, and, and I think one thing I'll, I'll add to that is that, as you know, one of the last conferences King went to was a conference, a rabbinical conference um, in, the, in, the, in the winter of, of, of 68, um, you know, early spring. And so, you know, his commitments there were real true, true and, and profound. And I think that's, that's important to remember. Yeah. All right, this is the end of our Q&A. It's been great, um, uh, Jonathan. I know there's more 
uh, that's about to be in store. But thank you so much. So proud of you. Congratulations. Uh, this book is the number one New York Times bestseller. Not number one. It's a bestseller. Well, Let's not be, exaggerate. Thank I'm you. I'm going to be proud to teach this book. Uh, it, it'll be number one in the next <laughs> week. After, after this, this after, after everybody goes after, after, after all this. The book. So, so everyone go out there and read it. It's really important good book. And, and congratulations again. Thanks, Peniel. Anil, uh, thank you so much too. Um, wonderful, wonderfully done. Uh, we really appreciate it. you guys have given us some really uh, remarkable insight, and we're very appreciative. Uh, as we do for all our American Inspiration authors, we have asked uh, Jonathan and I to do a quick reading from the book. Uh, back to you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, but in Hallowing King, we have hallowed him. From Montgomery to Chicago, along those streets named Martin Luther King Drive and Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and Martin Luther King Jr. Highway, poverty and segregation rates remain much higher than local and national averages. In those schools named for King, and in almost every school in America, King's life and lessons are often smoothed and polished beyond recognition. Young people hear his dream of brotherhood and his wish for children to be judged by the content of their character, but not his call for fundamental change in the nation's character, not his cry for an end to the evils of materialism, militarism, and racism. As King's friend, Harry Belafonte told me, in none of the history books do you read about radical heroes in this country. On my most recent visit to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, DC, in the spring of 2022, I found none of King's books for sale in the gift shop. Our simplified celebration of King comes at a cost. It saps the strength of his philosophical and intellectual contributions. It undercuts his power to inspire change. Even after Americans elected a black man as president and after that president, Barack Obama placed a bust of King in the Oval Office, the nation remains racked with racism, ethno-nationalism, cultural division, residential and educational segregation, economic inequality, violence, and a fading sense of hope that government or anyone will ever fix those problems. Where do we go from here? In spite of the way America treated him, King still had faith when he asked that question. Today, his words might help us make our way through these troubled times, but only if we actually read them, only if we embrace the complicated King, the flawed King, the human King, the radical King, only if we see and hear him clearly again, as America saw and heard him once before. Our very, our very survival, he wrote, depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. Amen. Thank you to our conversationalists, um, Peniel, John, we are very grateful. Um, thank you to our presenting partners. Uh, we've all learned a great deal. And thanks to GBH Forum Network for all they do behind the scenes, Andrew and Frederic, we are grateful. And to the audience out there in Zoomland, thank you on this sunny summer night for being with us, uh, for helping us to celebrate some aspects of Juneteenth and America's history. We are really glad that you tuned in. We appreciate your questions and your interest in, in America's history. We wish you all a good night. Thank you. <laughs>